But we'll move on to the ginkgo phyta now and the basic kinds of reproductive structures we've seen, the structure of the, uh, the basic structure of the ovule, the process of pollination and fertilization. All of those are gonna be the same in this group. There's gonna be differences in details. But the basic ideas we've established in the cycadophyta are also gonna hold in the ginkgo phyta. Differences are gonna be in morphology. The main differences are gonna be in morphology. And there are some striking differences in morphology between the ginkgo phyta and the cycadophyta. But the basic ideas of gymnosperm reproduction that we've learned are gonna hold for ginkgo phyta also. Ginkgo phyta, this is a very, um, this is a relatively old again group of plants. It has a single extant species. It's a species from China. Ginkgo biloba. And we'll see why that name is appropriate for it. It's called the maidenhair tree. And it's called the maidenhair tree because the leaves of ginkgo are, resemble at a very different scale, the leaves of the maidenhair fern. I don't know if you remember the maidenhair fern adiantum that we did last week. I guess it was, you saw it in lab. The resemblance is not really strong, I don't quite feel, and the leaves of adiantum are about this big and the leaves of ginkgo are about this big. So they're pretty different in size, but that's where the name comes from, the maidenhair tree, because of the similarity in the leaves. As I say, it's native to eastern China. It was known not in the wild when it was discovered by the West, but as a temple tree. So it had some religious significance. At least it was grown and uh, cultivated in temple grounds. And now it's grown all over the United States and all over the world. We have species on campus, and you should go out there and look at them and look for them as you learn what this thing looks like. There's a number of them over in the Bryan School, if you get over that area in the courtyards and things, but also in that parking lot in back of um, the art museum, there are a number of trees over there. And do you know of another one, Ms. Rushforth, that are the closer ones? Those are the ones that I, I know about. I think they're around other places too. We'll have them in lab, of course, today. So here's what, the plant looks like at least a little bit of it. Um, it's got seeds, these are the seeds. And again, there's gonna be a fleshy seed coat on those. So again, these really look like what you'd think of as fruits, but they are seeds. There are no mega stroboli. And no megasporophylls. Instead, the seeds, the ovules and the seeds, are born on little stems. I'm just going to say seeds. And the tactical name for these is peduncles. Peduncle is, uh, the ending is a diminutive ending and PED is foot. So little foot, little feet on the end of little feet. These are modified stems. So modified stems not born on leaves. So there are no megastroboli, megasporophylls here. No megastroboli, no megasporophylls. But we have these peduncles. We also have short shoots. when they're short because they have short inner nodes. And we have long shoots. And they're long because they have long inner nodes. The long shoots bear leaves only in the first year. So they normally bear, you know, leaf, long inner node, leaf, long inner node for the first year of growth. After that year, in the axle of each of those leaves, a short shoot arises. And from then on, all the leaves are born on the short shoots. And you see that here. You see there's no leaves on this shoot at this stage. No leaves here. There's just leaves on these short shoots, which were the axillary shoots in the axles of the leaves for the first year. 
The most striking thing about these plants are the leaves. There are the leaves, and you notice the leaves are very strongly wedge-shaped. And the name for wedge-shaped leaves, we know that already because we did the Ecclesiophyta or the Arthrophyta. These are sphenophylls. These are real sphenophylls. Sphenol means wedge, so these are really wedge-shaped leaves. And these leaves have other distinctive characters about their veination, especially we'll talk about in just a minute. Notice on this plant, you see only female seeds. Only this female is here. So this group of plants is also dioecious. There are separate male and female plants. Female plants bearing the seeds, male bearing the, the pollen bearing organs. See the same thing again here. Here's our long shoot. These are really mature seeds now. They have that kind of wrinkled texture on them. Um, many of these, these plants have really the reputation of smelling terrible. And it's the female seeds when they're mature that smell really bad. And so you don't find a lot of female plants being planted. They tend to plant males instead of females because of this reputation. Now, I, the female plants that I've seen have not, have not smelled that bad, but they've got a, and it may be because they're being bred differently now, but they have this reputation that they're gonna smell really bad. And here's the short shoot. <coughs> With our sphenophylls. There's a very typical sphenophyll. And I've run out of space. Sphenophylls again. And they're born on those short shoots. And this is the best picture of the leaves of the sphenophyll. And oftentimes the sphenophylls are two lobe. Here you see it a little bit. And that gives us our biloba name. Here it is down here. Two distinct lobes of the, of the sphenophylls. There's ginkgo biloba. Again, they're born on those short shoots. There's the distinctive characteristic of these leaves. And of other parts of this plant, the leaf venation is dichotomous. Very unusual for plants to have dichotomous venation. I think this is the only, re the only case. I know it's the only case we're going to see this semester. I actually can't think of another case where there's leaf dichotomous leaf venation. So every time it branches, it goes into two. There is a, a branch where it's coming together here. That is unusual. That's very unusual. They almost always are like this every time branching in two away from each other. And you see why that works so very well for a sphenophyll, it, the perfect venation system for a sphenophyll. So the plants, as I say, are dioecious. Here's the female side. That's what we've been talking about. There's the peduncle. Notice that the peduncle is dichotomous. It branches into two, and at the end of each branch, there's the ovule. The peduncles are born on short shoots. So there's a cluster of peduncles there. They're being produced in the early spring at the same time as the leaves. So the peduncles come out with our young ovules at the same time the leaves come out. So the female side is very distinctive. The male side is distinctive too, but now on the male side, we do have microstroboli. And there are, on those microstroboli, microsporophylls. These microsporophylls do not look leaf-like. They're very unleaf-like. They look like a little stalk with two little sacs at the end that are going to bear the microspores. 
we know that this is a branch and that's a leaf because of the structures of the venation. There's differences in how branches are vascularized, vascularized, vascularized versus how leaves are vascularized. And there's differences in how the vascular system connects to the stem for a branch and for a leaf. And so that's how we know. It's not things we're going to go over in this class, but that's how we know that that's a microsporophyll and the thing on the bottom is not a microsporophyll. It's really a modified branch. Notice that they are both, the peduncles and the microsporophylls are born on those short shoots. I say it again, they're only born on the short shoots. They're never born on the long shoots. And again, they're both born at the time when the leaves come out. In the cycads, we had secondary growth. We have secondary growth here. But in this case, now it's producing a wood. So the wood, I think we've talked about this before, is secondary xylem. And by secondary, I mean it's a part of the plant body that is produced by a tissue that, in grow, that, um, that in causes growth in girth. So when you think of a little a plant just coming up out of the ground, it's growing first initially in length. And that's called the primary growth of the plant, that growth in the length that occurs initially. In some plants, that's all that ever happens, like ferns. That's all that ever happens is that primary growth. There's no growth in girth. In other plants, there's a secondary growth, a growth in the girth of the plant. And you know all of our trees are like that. Trees and shrubs and all those things, they, get, they grow in girth. Now that growth in girth, in some cases, like the cycads, this, it's very soft, it's spongy almost. It's got a lot of living tissue in it. And then in other cases, like here's our first one in, in ginkgo, it's woody. And by woody, I mean it forms that stuff that we know of and we make all of our um, furniture out of. I would say all of our furniture, except we'd probably be hard pressed to find any actual wood in this room. I don't think that's wood either. On there either. Maybe these doors over here on the back side of the cabinet are wood. But you know what I mean by wood. Don't have it's getting to the point though where I it's it's a sad commentary that I would have to look around a room like this and try to find a piece of wood. Very difficult. Getting very difficult. So that comes from the secondary xylem, from the growth in girth. And here we find then that secondary xylem in that part of the tissue. And then there is secondary phloem here. And between the secondary xylem and the secondary phloem, we have the tissue that produces those things. That's this line, a single line of cells that runs all the way around. And that's called the vascular cambium. Cambium, you know, if you know any Romance languages, you know, the root for that means to change. So it is the, a, a, a layer of cells, a single layer of cells that changes the structure of the stem because it produces, it divides and it produces the xylem on the inside, secondary xylem and the secondary phloem on the outside, the, cam, the cambium. Vascular cambium because it produces the vascular system and because there is another cambium that occurs on the outside of the stem, out in this region, there is something called the cork cambium. There's another technical name for it, but we'll just call it cork cambium. And that's going to produce the bark of the tissue, the bark of the plant. So when you go out and you see the bark on all these trees, it's produced by a cambium that's outside near the periphery of the stem. That different cambium then produces the xylem. So that's secondary growth. We'll go over those things again when we get to other groups where we also have secondary growth. Here's our male short shoot and some of the micro stroboli. 
There's a microstrobilus. There is a microsporophyll. It's really dark, isn't it? And then there are sporangia on here. I'll draw it up here. Two sporangia. on each of those microsporophylls. Switch to white. Same thing again, now you see there's a sporangium that's open. There's the microstrobilus. Just a review of the same things we've been seeing already. Here's the female side, I'm sorry, the male side. The female side. Here's a dichotomous peduncle. And here's a peduncle that is not dichotomous. So there can be cases where there, are, there is no dichotomy, where you just have a single peduncle with an ovule on the top. And you've got these ovules at this stage. These are very different looking ovules than we saw in Zami or Cycas. They kind of look a little bit like Hershey kiss, Hershey's Kisses. This is the ovule at the time of pollination. They look like that. Here they are again, really a nice, much nicer picture. Here's the dichotomous. Here's the dichotomous peduncle. It's the ovule. That outer covering that I'm writing on top of is the integument. The micropile then would be down there. Go down the hole would be through that integument then. We'll look at that in a section, in a second, but here's a pollen grain. We start, here's a microspore. So this is the microspore, right? There's no gametophyte there, it's just the microspore wall and a single cell on the inside. The spore is unicellular. Here's the pollen grain. It's got a gametophyte inside. And so this is the process of development here. Now we're not going to worry about that intermediate stage here. We're going to look just at, briefly at the microspore and then at this mature pollen grain. And look at the cells there. You see in the <laughs> mature pollen grain, it's four-celled. So a difference between the cycadophyta, which was three-celled when it was shed, three-celled at maturity, here it's four-celled. And the difference is that we have two prothallial cells. The other two cells of the pollen grain are the same. We have a generative cell and a tube cell. Let's write them down here. So a generative cell and a tube cell. Here's the ovule. This is the ovule at the time of pollination. Looks very different from an ovule of zamia at the time of pollination. But we have the same basic structures now. Here's the integument. No zonation in the integument now, single structure. It's a very young. Here is the megasporangium. And down here at this stage, this is a very young stage, this is the megaspore. So we have 
a very young ovule here, but this very young ovule is at the time of pollination. So at this time, we would be finding the pollination drop produced and the pollen being drawn down into the pollination chamber. It's going to land on that megasporangium and it's going to start growing down through the megasporangium. But the megasporangium is growing at the same time. So there's this arms race going on. The megasporangium grows, the pollen green grows, the megasporangium grows, the pollen team grows, and if the next generation is going to exist, the pollen grain better win. That. Yes, otherwise there's no fertilization. Here's the process taking place at a later stage. You can see now, here's the pollination chamber. There's, it says male gametophyte there, but what we're going to say is that's the pollen tube. And you see that that is growing through the megasprangium. Let me highlight the megasprangium with yellow. So it grows through the megasporangium. The pollen tube grows through the megasporangium. And you can see there's been a tremendous enlargement of the megasporangium there. Oh, the whole ovule has tremendously enlarged, and the female gametophyte has now formed. In the earlier stage we looked at, there was no female gametophyte. That megaspore has now grown into the megagametophyte. And inside that megagametophyte, we, of course, have the archegonium and the egg. And here is the archegonial chamber. Where our pollen grain is going to just drop our sperm. So this would be a pollen tube at the time when it's entering the archegonial chamber. <laughs> Here's the sperm. Looks very much like the sperm of the cycadophyta, no huge differences here. And here is the young embryo embedded in the megagametophyte. Megagametophyte, here's the embryo again. We're starting to see that structures we've drawn several times and we will come back to learn the names of later. Here then is the seed. Not sure we're going to have time to label all the starts here, but you can find the, the <coughs> structures here from what we've done. The only thing I'll tell you here, this, what that thing is, that's an aborted ovule. <coughs> so that's about the size of that ovule that we saw at the very beginning, and you can see the tremendous size difference between the seed, the mature seed, with the seed coat, and the size of the young ovule prior to that. That's it. Very good.